Okay, I think we're most of us are back in our seats, which is great. Um, maybe just give it a few more seconds. And thank you, uh, Sue and uh, Ian, for the last session. We're going to um, continue now with our, our second keynote speaker of the day. Um, my name's Ian Gwilt. I'm a um, academic and researcher here at U UDSA in the School of Art, Architecture and Design. So I've got a design background. So slightly, slightly out of my comfort zone here, but um, I think there are a lot of parallels in terms of uh, our interface with technologies. Um, and it's my pleasure to, um, to welcome Mahendra May, who's going to be our next uh, speaker, from the British Library. Um, myself and Mahendra, we were just discussing when we first met, I think it was possibly in 2013 or 14. Um, at that time, I was an academic at the uh, Sheffield Hallam University. The Sheffield is um, a sort of comfortable hour and 40 minutes north of, uh, of London. Um, you come into the rather splendid um, St. Pancras station on the train. Uh, and then there's a short stroll across uh, across one road to the British Library. We do take your life in your hands because of the London taxis, but it's a lovely short stroll across one street, slightly dangerous, and there you are uh, at the British Library uh, and the rather impressive sort of architecture um, that uh, is the new library. But there's something interesting about the architecture and the authority that goes with it, and in particular as you go into the foyer, um, there's a sort of Babel Tower of uh, printed books which you encounter as you come in, and that can be a little daunting. So the, the reason why I mention that, I think, is that alongside of that, under the leadership of Mahendra, um, the BL Labs have been quietly exploring and revealing the potential of the digital library. Digital library is a dynamic, distributed, creative, and democratic resource, and I think there's some really interesting work that's been going on there, and, and obviously that will be at the center of Mahendra's talk. Um, I was struck by the workshop we had on Tuesday, the comments, some of those sort of figures around this idea that 85% um, of the digital content that's already been converted is only accessible in the library, whatever being in the library means, and I'm sure you'll unpack that. Uh, and that um, in total, this only represents about 3%, 3 of the whole of the uh, digital content, the whole of the contents of the library. So only 3% is digitized. So quite interesting. Quite interesting facts, particularly if you think about uh, Dennis's uh, talk uh, yesterday around this sort of relationship between physical and digital agents. And um, I'm sort of struck by this idea of how much we're still quite reliant on this um, notion of the embodied and located experience of digital content. So that's quite interesting. I'm sure you'll talk a little bit about that. So as I say, Mahindra um, has been the manager of the British Library Labs um, for over five years where he's been encouraging and helping scholars, artists, entrepreneurs, educators, and innovators to work with the library's digital collections and to curate and create stories from these archives. And I think uh, he's doing a great job there. Um, for those of you who have talked to Mahendra and uh, maybe came to the workshop, you have a witness his um, energetic enthusiasm for his, his trade and his knowledge and, and his generosity in spirit uh, and generosity of spirit in sharing that knowledge. And um, again, we'll see this in a second. So Mahendra, is, he's here to talk about not just the work they're doing at BL Labs, um, but also to connect with people and, uh, and to discuss potential collaborations and projects. So please make sure you find him during the, um, the rest of the conference and actually uh, have those conversations if you've not already started them. Uh, importantly, Mahendra tells me that he's currently working on developing uh, an international network of, of libraries, digital libraries, to share knowledge, experience, and expertise in the digital library concept. So I haven't uh, looked at his bio, well, I have looked at it, but we haven't gone through it because it's, it's too ex extensive and, and uh, you know, you can't capture a polymath in, in 30 seconds. So please go and have a look on the website and um, you'll see some of his background history there. So 
on that note, I'd like to uh, welcome Mahendra to the stage. Thank you. Too kind, Ian. <laughs> um, okay, so um, my challenge is I have a lot of slides, and I'm going to speak quite quickly. Um, but if you want to download my slides, the link on the right uh, should go to uh, a Google Drive. And on there, there's also a little present of a, a music mix from a DJ that works with our collections, just DJ Yoda. I'll talk a bit more about that in my presentation. So uh, let's start. So just very briefly, for those of you that don't know about the British Library, uh, um, that's, the, um, that's the main building in, at St Pancras. Uh, there's also a storage facility at Boston Spa. Um, the thing that a lot of people don't know is um, the library is supposed to look like a ship. I don't know if, any, if you can see it. Um, and it's a ship of knowledge... <laughs> A ship of knowledge sailing through a Gothic landscape. The, the, uh, the Gothic landscape bit is the St. Pancras Hotel um, just behind the ship. But um, it's one of the largest libraries in the world. You know, what more can I say? It's pretty an incredible place to work, actually. So um, the, when I arrived at the library, I was trying to understand what it was all about. It's a really large, complex organization, and it took me a few years until our chief executive wrote his vision. And from that moment, I thought, oh, that's what the library's for, okay? So I would really recommend you read this. It's actually a really interesting document. Uh, Rowley's vision for the next eight years in terms of what the library's purpose is. And for most people, they, they think it's about looking after stuff and research, but actually we do many other things. We support businesses, so we provide intellectual property advice for startups. Uh, we have a huge cultural program. We do events. We've had um, concerts inside the library. They had a fantastic Halloween event, I remember. That was my first event. Uh, we have a learning program, and we have a huge interna international dimension. We do lots of international projects. So there's lots of links on my slides. So if you download, you can go to videos and, and documents and stuff. So this slide is just to say we have a lot of stuff. All those numbers are made up, okay? Um, we don't actually know exactly how much stuff we have. Uh, there's lots of arguments, but our books are only about 10% of our collection, okay? So that kind of gives you an idea of the scale of it. That's the, um, the Babel Tower that um, Ian was talking about. It's called the King's Library. Um, they, he, it was donated to the British Museum and on condition that the books had to be on display. So they're on display, but you, you, you can actually take them out, but you can only see them in the reading room. So it's a reference library. I, I forgot to mention that. But we have a lot of other stuff. So we have a huge collection of patents, st stamps, um, six million sound recordings, the largest collection of pop music in the world, uh, 1.6 million musical scores, and various other things. So for me, the library is like this, OK? It's like, imagine going to a huge hypermarket and it's just got lots of stuff, okay? And it's like a, it feels like a factory, okay? And that's what I, oh, that's the thing that chimes in my head. And also, there's secret stuff if you ask the assistants and they'll say, oh, we'll just go get that from the warehouse, okay? Um, but that's what it's like looking for our physical collections. And we pretty much have, I think we have something from every printed language in the world. So I'm going to switch on to the digital, and Ian's kind of already sort of alluded to this, but only 3% of our physical collections are digitized. Again, that's a guess. Um, and we used to use government money to do that digitization, but increasingly we're having to do more things as, uh, in terms of commercial partnerships or philanthropic donations. Um, we're increasing the amount that we digitize rapidly. We have a new program called Heritage Made Digital, where people can actually, researchers can say, we have a demand to use that, please digitize it for us. Um, the thing to note is if you're doing academic research on our digital collections, they're not always representative of the physical collections. That's kind of a really important thing that you need to understand. 
and only 15% of our collections are openly licensed. It's about 720 collections, okay? So one of the collections is the UK web, which is billions of sites, okay? So the scale is kind of mind-blowing, actually. 85% of our collections are only available on-site, and on-site is open to interpretation. We also collect born digital stuff, so we're the home of the UK web archive. We've been archiving the UK web for a long time. Um, and also we're the home of the Alan Turing Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Data Science. So the thing is, um, the reason why that figure's not higher is uh, looking after digital stuff costs money, digitizing costs money, um, and that sort of explains why it's so small. In terms of providing access to our collections on site, um, that presented me with a very, very specific challenge because some of our collections can only be seen in the reading rooms. These are digital things. Some of them aren't even online. Um, they're on disk. Uh, some of them are on site, and on site is a kind of loose interpretation of what that means. That you can you can kind of you can kind of wangle things actually on, on on that definition. And then also sometimes you have to pay for access, and a small amount is in the happy place outside where it's all available freely. So the way we cracked this problem was we developed a residency model. And what that does is basically you have to be security cleared, and effectively you become a member of staff. You, get, you go behind the curtain. And what happens then is something magical happens because if once you become a member of staff, you're not an annoying researcher trying to get an answer to a research question. You are a colleague. And that's had a huge impact in terms of actually getting stuff done. There could be further um, permissions required because it's actually, there could be all sorts of things about why you can't access a digital collection and uh, sometimes it's not even online, still on the original tape. And also there will be specific agreements about particular collections in terms of how they were licensed and so forth. <laughs> the truth is we're learning how to provide that access and it's almost on a case by case basis. Uh, we currently provide hot desks for members of, for researchers in residence or artists in residence. Uh, but we're actually experimenting to provide that in the reading rooms. So, um, remember the, the, the picture of the hypermarket? This is what it's like looking for digital stuff. Okay? It's, a, it's a sweet shop. Um, there's some free stuff for sampling. If you speak nicely to the sweet shop owner, you can, you can go back into the warehouse and have a little rummage there, and it's like... Um, Enormous. So, uh, we do a lot of engagement. We talk to lots of people. It, and that's the one thing I would say, if you're gonna set up a lab, you have to go out and talk to people. And these are the typical conversations we have with people. So, remember only 3% of our stuff's digitized, okay? So what people do is they always ask us, oh, have you got that? They think you're a walking catalog. Okay, and the chances that we have what they want in digital form is obviously very low because it's only three percent. So we have this special category, and I call them the lucky dip researchers. It's like, oh my God, we've got exactly what you want. Isn't this amazing, right? That rarely happens. I think that's probably happened about ten times in five years. Okay. Uh, this is more common, uh, yeah, we don't exactly have what you want, but we've got this, are you interested in that? So that engagement is actually incredibly hard work. Um, and you have to do it. We tend to attract projects which have fuzzier boundaries and possibly more open to sort of interdisciplinary collaborative research, early career researchers who maybe haven't decided where, where their career is going to go, but actually, the most exciting stuff for me personally has been working with creatives and artists because they kind of ask different questions. They kind of say, well, what have you got? Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the, this is kind of five years of lessons that I've learned. Um, I'm not, it's just animated, right? But 
Uh, these are all the kinds of questions you really need to know about a collection. And the most important one is the last one. Is there a human being at the library who can tell you about that collection? Because there will be stuff inside their head that will not be written down. So, the lab, what challenges does it address? Well, it's partly addressing this, this particular challenge, which is the money that we spent on digitization. And it's looking for return on investment, because obviously we've spent all this money digitizing it. Um, you know, we need to know people are actually going to use it for useful things. Um, also, actually knowing what collections there are that can be used openly and on site, and how do we tell people? Okay, the telling is the key. So making connections is really apt for the work that we do. Sometimes people need to understand the, the shape of the collection or how they feel. They need to kind of explore them. And sometimes that data is incredibly messy and dirty. Okay? Um, and finally, once we discover things, um, how do we celebrate um, old culture and remix it with new culture. And that's what's happening a lot with our projects. So why are we doing this? Well, it's our job to support research, but actually we're listening to what people want. And we're learning what they want to do. At the, t at the beginning of the project, we didn't have a clue. And that has evolved over the years. And we've started to realize there's certain patterns. Um, so what we're learning is what we are providing and what we should be providing to be able to, for them to do their work. So things like, are we providing the right access and discovery to our collections? Are we providing the right advice, technical support and training, services, tools and processes, and many, many other things. So we're learning as we're doing it. And really, the most important thing is we're, trying, we're learning and discovering where the gaps are and where, and we need to know how to build the bridges uh, to overcome those gaps. Sometimes we can't build a bridge because we haven't got the money. Sometimes we build uh, rickety bridges that are a bit dodgy, but they kind of get the job done. And also, sometimes we're having to help people navigate their way through the maze of the library. And I'm talking also about the culture of the organization. So, um, Often, we're finding that researchers and artists and entrepreneurs and educators need a translator to be able to, for them to understand the culture of the organization and for them to really understand um, what that organization is about in order to do a sort of an effective and impactful project. So this is, this is where the lab space is. We have our punters who have research interests and we have our collections. And I think we work at that intersection. And, you know, that we're trying to make connections. And that's actually really, really hard work. Okay? So, as we've been, when we started out in the project, our work was very much focused on researchers. But that's all the other stakeholders that we've ended up working with. Just by serendipity. People turn up, oh, you want to do an art project. You're a curator, you're an archivist, and so forth. So how do you find our stuff? Well, that's a good question. Um, we have collection guides, 219 as of yes, uh, two days ago. We also have a, a portal called data.bl.uk where you can download big chunks of data. And, um, you know, health warning, it ain't pretty, some of it, okay? What we decided to do was embrace dirty data because we didn't have the resources to curate those collections. We just said, let's just get it out there. Every, every data set has a DOI, and so it's referenceable. And um, we've, I purchased nine terabytes from IT, so I think we're about six terabytes on there now at the moment. So how do we do this engagement? So for about four years, we ran a competition where we asked people to come up with ideas of what to do um, with our collections. And we kind of had to start from somewhere because at the beginning it was incredibly difficult because we were effectively flogging an abstract concept. So we did, we did the competition for a few years and it was great. 
We now have a new service called Digital Research Support. We still work with people's ideas, but what we do, we are able to offer about five days support per project. And we effectively take their ideas and put it into the reality of the data that we have and what's actually achievable. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. What we have done is we try to expand our reach by running awards. And the awards are actually a fantastic way to find out who's actually doing things with our data and our collections. So the categories have emerged over the years, research, artistic, commercial, learning and teaching. And we actually now have a staff award, which has been fantastic because we get buy-in from staff about what we're doing. And Ian alluded to this, we also, I'm genuinely um, sincere about having conversations and making connections because we work on collaborative projects. You know, we're a research organization. We work on very, very large projects. And all of this works through engagement. So we do roadshows. We don't actually have a van yet, just it's on the train. Um, events, meetings, conversations. And that's kind of how it works. And, and it's exhausting. It's really tiring, but you kind of have to do it. There's some stats for you. Um, I've really clocked up my miles now coming to Australia. <laughs> so, um, but you know, just that just you know we, we that just shows you the scale of what we what we what we do. I mean, we we've probably worked on about 150 projects in five years. Um, we've posted data to people in in packages because it's actually quicker to do that sometimes. And we've probably had over a billion views through various projects that we've worked on. So basically, there is no secret formula. It's really hard work, okay? And what we've learned also is that um, people are all different. And you, know, you have to spend that time understanding what they want to do. Sometimes there are patterns, but it's actually almost on an individual basis in terms of what people want to do. So these are some sort of takeaway things that we learned from the you know, early days. So start a conversation, generate positive energy, encourage fun, play, experimentation, and to try to, try to support as many ideas as, as humanly possible. Be kind and be nice and uh, share and genuinely feel that you want to help people. Uh, we encourage people to start very small, and it can be extremely simple use of our collections, but, but it's okay to think big as well. Um, we're, we're not prescriptive about the tools that people want to use, but we also have learned to keep it simple. Policies and processes for reuse of collections are critical. It's okay to fail, but just keep trying. We are sincere believers of rejecting perfectionism. You, it's the enemy of progress. Good enough is sometimes good enough. Um, and also, we try, we're trying to look at services that allow useful exploration of cultural heritage data. Um, there are actually not that many out there. The typical problem of libraries is like, we can't find the stuff. Um, also, what we've learned is exploring data is difficult, especially if it's large amounts like our largest data set on data.bl is about half a terabyte. And often people need specific skills, and they don't always have those skills. So do we offer training, or do, they, or do we encourage collaborations, for example, with computer scientists? The really important thing is, once you find stuff, tell the world, celebrate it. And success, you know, it's just a cliche, but it's true. It's usually the right people, the right place, the right time. So that means there's going to be lots of failures, but failures are okay. So we have a committee in the British Library called Access and Reuse, and they meet, and they basically decide on the licensing. Um, and that committee is interesting because you see many competing concerns of the library. So some of them are legal, but some of them could be commercial or ethical. And they meet about six every six weeks, and a collection is presented, a digital collection is presented, and they make a decision. One of the earliest collections um, that were approved was a collection of books that were digitized by Microsoft. And I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, uh, in a couple of slides, sorry. So I'm going to sort of go into a little bit of my journey um, starting at the library. So I started mid-March 2013. 
Five days later, I had to launch a competition. Okay? I immediately saw a risk because we were supposed to only award the, um, one winner. And I used the language of risk to argue that we needed to have two people. So I got the budget split. Um, and also, I felt this can't be just about two privileged people. This has to be about opening the doors of this place. So we started to have more and more conversations. One of the great things we did was uh, the winners own their own IP, their own intellectual property. So they do not sign a contract according to their affiliation. They do it as independent researchers. And there was legal reasons why we had to go down that route. And also another good thing was at the beginning, we needed ideas to inspire people. So we asked people to agree to publish their ideas even if they weren't chosen. And this was a great way to be able to then go and rock up at an institution and say, oh, this is an idea, this is an idea. They're real ideas. But to be honest, what we really needed was real examples. So some reflections on our competition. The downside is there has to be a winner, okay? And, and then there's the rest, okay? And the problem is you have a guilty conscience because you really want to help everyone. You can't. And you end up bumping into those people at conferences. And um, anyway, so we had to start somewhere. So I would recommend it as a good idea. But I think our role as a national library is to find a way to support anyone who wants to use our collections, digital collections, anywhere actually in the world. So <laughs> I said I would do it, Terry, you're OK. Um, so not being chosen as a winner can rankle for years. So I, um, I had this last night um, in dinner, right? So, um, so that's um, Terry Nermico, Muller? Fuller, Fuller, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to say, forgive me, Terry, OK? Um, but you, yeah, yeah, it's kind of the cute cat always works, right? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about um, a dream collection that really, maybe we were lucky. I don't know, OK? But I came across this collection. And it was, it's a collection that just keeps giving and giving and giving. And it was a happy accident, actually. And sometimes those are the best things in life. So Microsoft came to the British Library. They wanted to digitize some books because they saw Google digitizing books. So we signed a contract with them. And basically, at the end of the process, they actually digitized, they paid for the digitization of 68,000 books. There's a mismatch because 3,000 were wrongly digitized. Okay? They were supposed to be out of copyright. And basically, what Microsoft did, they did something incredible. They ripped up the contract. And they says, you can just have it. So in 2012, this was one of the first collections that went to the Access and Reuse Committee. And we made it public domain. And that means you can do whatever you want with that collection, commercial or non-commercial. And this is where the magic starts to happen. So I go to my first event, uh, University of Nottingham. And I have a, a room of blank researchers thinking, hmm, well, you know, 2%, um, you know, he hasn't really got anything, right? I came away really depressed, thinking, God, this is going to be harder than I thought it was going to be. And I'm sitting on the train, and I meet um, a Latin American scholar. And we're talking, and she says, you know those books that you were talking about, Mahendra? She says, I'm sure there are Latin American titles in there. I said, probably there are. You know, I didn't have a clue. Um, she said, well, I said, look, I could send you an Excel spreadsheet. She says, I don't do Excel. So I printed it out. This is the actual spreadsheet, OK? And I posted it to her, and she highlighted it with a mark pen. I, it came back. I then found 1,200 titles. She then worked on a pilot project with a computer scientist at the University of Nottingham. So the point is, uh, engagement is always about people. So at the beginning, um, there weren't many library labs in the world. Okay? So it's the day of the deadline of our competition, and I am labs. It's me. Okay? And it's 5 o'clock, and there are no entries. <laughs> right? And the, the deadline's midnight. 
And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is going to be an effing disaster, right? <laughs> By midnight, we had 26 entries, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love academics, right? <laughs> um, and basically, um, we had two finalists, both academics, but the deal was they had to work during their holidays, because that's the only time we could give them. And uh, they got a small amount of money, it was about 3,000 pounds for travel. We didn't pay their wages. They were doing it for the love of it. They were security cleared, and that security cleared clearance was like magic because all the doors and just disappeared. They could just do stuff. You know, they could rock in with their, with their staff card, and there's all sorts of benefits, by the way, with the staff card. Um, and yeah, they could just, they could get access to our collection, so I thought, I'm definitely keeping that one, right? And this is what we did. It was a bit evil, but we said, okay, we're gonna have a symposium in November where you have to show the world what you did, okay? So you've got a hard deadline. And um, they only get their prize money at the end, okay? So the winner gets 3,000 and the runner-up gets 1,000. And they get the glory forever of having been a BL Labs winner and all of that business. So this was our, one of our first finalists, Peter Francois. And I'm just going gonna, gonna to whiz through some of these examples. But basically, he wants to create a search tool to look through the metadata of 19th century books. And the take home message that we learned from that was basically, are we okay for time? Okay, um, there, uh, what we learned was, and this is kind of like a dough moment, oh my God, there are biases in our uh, digitized collections, which we, t you know, was a surprise to us, right? But actually he was thinking that the digitized collection was representative of the physical collection. But what we actually learned was the curatorial decisions about what got digitized was a bit random. There was no method. Dan Norton uh, was doing a, he was an academic, but also a DJ. And basically his idea was to take library digital collections, mix them and create new performances. And very ambitious project. What we learned from him was that every single item needs to have its own unique URL. I know that doesn't sound like much, but it actually was really important to us. So we're starting, we're learning as we're going along. So we decided to eat our own dog food. Okay? And what that means is practice what you preach. Um, and we had our dream a collection, we thought, let's do some experiments ourselves. We're telling other people to do experiments. We should be doing it ourselves. So we ran a hack event in June. Somebody called Matt Pry came up with a really interesting idea, basically to cut out all the images from digitized books. Relax, librarians. We're not, not real books, but digitized books. And basically, we did it algorithmically. There's a link there for people who are interested. Um, the code's available for free. Uh, it's basically using the OCR process because the OCR process identifies images. And basically, we needed an example, a really important example, to show the power of what happens when you have a public domain collection that has a unique URL. Every item has a unique URL. There's API access, which is application programming interface. And that is a, a computational way to get access to those collections. It's a bit like a researcher on rocket fuel. Um, but also, we wanted to be able to make it really simple for people to be able to engage with those collections. So anyone with really basic skills could do it. So we snipped out the images. And we ran a, a little experiment on face recognition um, using photographic um, training sets. And what we discovered, because these were illustrations, the software was really good at identifying female faces, but rubbish at ident identifying male faces. And that's probably because male faces were exaggerated. They had beards, hats, glasses, guns, animals on their, shol on their shoulders. Um, but it was a kind of practice what we preach thing. It was quite fun. But through that, we actually thought we'll create a provocation to our 200 curators. We created the mechanical curator, which basically publishes an image from the books 
every 30 minutes. It's still going, and, but we gave the mechanical curator a brain. So every time it publishes an image, it tries to find a similar image using, algor using algorithms, like, is the image slanty? Does it contain circles and so forth? But really, what we started to find out was people were saying, these images are so beautiful, can we just have them, please? So we, we approached our IT department, and the first thing they said, well, we're going to have to have a committee for this. And I said, mm, nah. So we approached Wikimedia. Wikimedia refused. They said, you're effectively dumping a million images from books with no descriptions, and you expect our volunteers to add tags to them? You know, are you kidding us, right? So eventually, we settled for Flickr Commons. Flickr Commons basically met our criteria. Each, each image has a unique URL, and it has an API. There were about a million images, and what we realized, we were getting into an experiment of tagging. There was huge press coverage when we, uh, we did pull the trigger, and there's been some really lovely commercial uses of those images. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a skateboard and a card game. Since we launched, we've had over a billion views and 17 and a half million tags added and more demand to see the items. What we also did was provide links back to our services and we actually got complaints from IT because uh, they said our servers are slowing down. So I think real innovation breaks infrastructure, okay? And that's, that's what we did, right? So, um, so I'm gonna now whiz through because I know that I'm I've got to get, speak quicker now because I've got so much to do. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a typical pattern of research that we found provides value to the library. So people, researchers come to us with research questions, but also we are looking for things that will help us. So I characterize these as finding invisible or well-hidden things in messy historical data. By the way, that's not the British Library, that storage area. Um, and the idea is that using various techniques, we would find things in these messy archives and we would then find them and then celebrate hidden histories and through art events, art and performance. So this is the sort of approach that we started to use. So imagine I'm looking for Mrs. Folly uh, in our newspaper archives. She's an Irish immigrant and that's the, that's the messy data that we're faced with. That's the OCR. So we're looking for that, okay? So this is a typical pattern of research. First of all, surprise, surprise, you actually need to use human methods to clean it up. And we get something called human ground truth. And then we write code to find things in that reliably. Then we try the code on messy content and we do lots of iterations, lots of tweaking. And effectively, we're digital cowboys and cowgirls throwing lassoes around content, which says, yeah, there you go, we've got you. And sometimes it requires another human sift. This is kind of a typical pattern. We've also done experiments with machine learning. Um, I'm just gonna quickly whiz through these, but basically all I want to say is machine learning is like, like humans reading. Um, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, there are nervousnesses about doing this, especially amongst publishers. But I thought I'd bring a very quick sort of story from history as a metaphor to sort of explain how machine learning works. Effectively, you're using machines to get the essence of something, identify patterns. So if you know this story, don't shout out, okay? Um, Nasruddin was a 13th century Turkish Sufi wise man who would go around on his donkey solving problems. And there's a... He comes across an incident, okay? There's a, there's, a, there's a poor man who's standing outside a restaurant and he smells this beautiful soup. And all he has is a piece of bread. So he puts a piece of bread out and hoping the smell of the soup will go waft onto the piece of bread. The owner comes out and is really angry, says like, what are you doing? You're stealing my soup, okay? Nasruddin rocks up on his donkey, he says, oh yes, I see there's a problem here. He says, yes. I'm afraid you must pay this man. So he said, but I don't have any money. He says, okay, I'll have some money. Takes out some coins. He's just about to give it to the restaurant owner, puts it in his hand and shakes his hands so the person can hear the coins. 
That's your payment. I'm not saying any more. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, the Victorian Mean Machine. This was a project insanely difficult um, to find jokes in our 19th century archives. Um, we ended up creating something called the Mechanical Comedian, which was a, a take on the mechanical curator. And basically, that's a really bad Victorian joke, which was uh, tied to uh, an image. And it, it releases on social media, and we see what the reaction is. Actually, it's getting a lot of traction. Bob's had loads of publicity. He's been out doing lots of public engagement. There's um, really bad, um, um, really like dated jokes. Like This is a, an animation of mother-in-law jokes. And this is a comedy night we had at the British Library to bring these jokes alive. So we got some comedians to take them and try to make them funny again. Um, political Meetings Mapper, I'm just going to whiz through this, was a project to find political meetings in a particular newspaper. What was great about Katrina was that she knew exactly which newspaper, which page, which column to find the stuff. And this is the, this is the great quote. Just learning a little bit of code, she was able to do something that would have taken her 10 years to do manually. And what we learned was that she really knew her stuff, she knew where to look, it was great. Um, Hannah Rose Murray was doing something similar with our digitized newspapers, but she was looking for speeches about black abolitionism. Insanely difficult computational problem. Uh, we, we started to do some experiments on machine learning. She had to give us a thousand articles that she had found manually first, just so we could train the machines. This was a project called Digital Music Lab, where we, we actually successfully managed to do text and data mining in, um, uh, non -commercial, uh, for non-commercial research in, in copyright music recordings. Okay, I'm going to have to whiz through here. I'm really sorry, but um, because of the images that we put on to Flickr, um, we realized that we were going into crowdsourcing. The crowd is actually quite lazy, okay? Um, <laughs> half a million people added one tag and never came back, okay? Our top hardcore taggers are 18 people around the world. Um, Chico45 is a human tagger. James and Maria are humans, but they use computational methods to do the tagging. Chico is 77 year old, a 77-year-old man from LA who's bedridden, and he's tagged about 45,000 images. Uh, that's, um, that's a game, a mobile phone game that was developed um, by a project in America, and that was an HRC project looking at developing a tagging engine. We also built an arcade game, um, uh, an arcade, we built an arcade machine with games on it where we actually tried to develop computer games to try and make tagging fun. We found 50,000 maps through a combination of computational and human effort. This is a project from three undergraduates who won our competition against postdocs, and they basically used artificial intelligence to tag all one million images. This is their attempt at captioning those images. That's a man standing in the field with a cow. That's supposed to be a close-up of a bird on a tree branch. <laughs> so we still need some work to be done, but it was, I was, they were the most fun to work with, I, best project I've ever worked on. This was a project that was actually trying to look at what happened to our Flickr images. Does anybody, does anybody have a guess what was the number one reuse of our images, the public domain images? Sorry? They were being resold. This is a project um, for, that I worked on with an artist, David Normal, and basically he created collages using those images, painted them, Really nice, and then he made them into light boxes at Burning Man. Then I worked with him, and I'm gonna have to skip this bit because I don't have time. We had a party. We basically, I'll, I'll very quickly talk over this, but basically we had a party where we unveiled this thing, and um, we basically brought the artwork to the British Library, and I'm trying to get to the slide, but the picture on this is not gonna work, so. What we did do was we built an app where you could take, it would identify an image from, and it would take you back to the page of the book where the image came from. This is Maria Klingerman, who is a code artist. 
and he uses code to create art. So these are 44 men who look 44. He did that for his 44th birthday. These are 19 tragic looking women he found in the archive algorithmically. This is a hat on the ground spells trouble, which he did algorithmically. This is a music video from Malaysia. Um, I'm actually going to Malaysia after this conference and I'm going to meet up with these people. Uh, it was a journalist who basically created a music video for her friend's band. And uh, we're going to do a thing at um, um, the National Library of Malaysia. To, and hopefully they're going to perform. This is a project I'm working with at the minute uh, with an artist who's taking our digitized maps and the live data that's around those maps and converting them into artworks, um, either physical or digital or in virtual reality. Oops. So I'm going to have to wrap up. Um, what we've learned is that people's ideas always change once they experience the data and the culture of the organization. So it's really important people do that first before they come up with a research question that actually could be answered. Um, we're now into the final phase of the project. We, we're estimating we're going to get about 1,500 requests per year to do things with our collections. And we're looking at the kinds of things that we need to do to support them. Uh, basically, we're moving from a project to business as usual services. We're, we're trying to figure out how we can do this in the reading rooms. Um, we recently ran an event two weeks ago where we basically invited national libraries, state libraries, university libraries, public libraries, who either have a lab or want a lab, to come together and share knowledge. It was a fantastic event. It was, all it was a workshop driven by Google Docs. Um, we now have a book we're supposed to write as a, as a result of it, a cookbook. Um, basically, so we had 43 libraries from over 20 countries. And basically, my final message is, um, if anybody wants to join us, and that includes the glam sector, who are doing similar things like this. So, Christy, are you here? Yep. Um, basically, we have a set of values. Okay, I need to say this bit. Leave your ego at the door, please, because we have no time for it here. Work hard, but also have fun. Mistakes are the greatest gifts and teachers. We want input from everyone. Make our time count. Um, work together, collaborate, cooperate, be kind, fearless, generous, share, but be fair, have passion to change the world, even if it's just a little bit at a time. And basically, by doing this, we're going to be able to build better labs. Thank you. because I've worked with material from the British Library and for about three years I used the physical stuff because I didn't know there was a digital collection of it as one example. Um, and actually getting people to know what's there inspires so much, much more. But it, it's quite a difficult process. Yeah, I'm, um, so we kind of did it the only way we knew how was to go out and talk to people. I know that sounds very medieval. <laughs> But that's actually, it kind of works. But the one thing I would say is, um, ideally, you want to be able to provide computational access to those collections. Because I think there's going to be a general, generational shift in the education of DH. And I think what we're discovering is that a lot of people who want to, I would call them DH wannabes, who don't really have the skills, but want to do DH things because, you know, it's on message and so forth, but actually um, what we, we're, we're actually trying to figure this out ourselves. Do we provide training? Do we provide, um, you know, do we, do we nudge people to go to the right places to get support? Um, I think it's probably gonna be a mixture of lots of things, but um, we can't assume just because we have a physical space, people are going to come to us. We have to go out. And the, the really important ad, ad, ad advocacy is when if there is a, a somebody who's actually done things with our collections, who's standing here and talking, that is the most powerful thing you can have to convince people. But we, we now have, we have those people. But it's taken five years to get there. 
Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. I'm so excited by all these projects. Um, my question is, you, you talk about these zip files and messy data that you provide. Um, and presumably, all of these projects, the people who work with the data are cleaning it to some extent to, for their own purposes. Do you have a pipeline for getting that cleaned data then back into your collection for other people? So um, we had a workshop on Tuesday doing exactly that. <laughs> um, so um, I think if I could go back in time, and if I had the resources, I would curate those collections. I would make them more semantically meaningful because then it's, it's a much easier sell than just giving them a spreadsheet with 65,000 rows in. Um, but interestingly, what you say is if people are augmenting the data, getting it back into our system has, systems has been quite political. Um, the data is not good enough. And the challenge you have to face is you have to tell people that catalog data as it exists is, pro there's lots of errors. You know, 1950 question mark is not a computational date. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a valid date. But you know, there's, so there's quite a lot of challenges, political challenges. But we have managed with the Flickr uh, to put some of the metadata back into our discovery layers, but it, it's, it's taken a long time. Uh, Mahindra, um, I'm interested in the fact that you're looking to build a, I guess, a community of practice. And across the water over in Europe, uh, there's a lot of agreements in place between European research infrastructures and LIBA, the European Research Library. So I'm just wondering um, uh, whether you're seeing that network. Yep, so Lottie came from, from Lottie Wilms from the Dutch National Library or KB Labs, things like that. So um, we're actually trying to figure out where our next gig is, okay? Um, basically, what we want to do is we want to convert this into a book, because we're all libraries and we love books, right? So we will want it to be practical, it's gonna be open access, but we want to do another version, which is going to be a showcase, which is going to be a coffee book, coffee table book, which you actually have to buy, and generates income, which will then, have, we will have a travel bursary for people who, you know, need to, we, so we can meet up. Um, also, um, just to say, um, the book sprint is going to be followed by a reading sprint. That was Kelly's idea yesterday. <laughs> um, I, it was on the slide, but I forgot to mention it. Um, but we're actually, you know when you, when you have an event and there's so much enthusiasm and it's, it's palpable, that's great, but it's like, what do you do next? And, you know, you know, we get inspired really quickly and then 10 minutes later we're having a cheese sandwich. Right, you know, so it's actually the hard work, and we're, we're basically trying to get people, like minded people, who have that passion and that energy. And I call it sort of assembling the Kung Fu Panda squad. So you're kind of looking for all the different superpowers, and everybody can complement each other. Uh, but you know, um, but based on principles of I know this sounds very hippie, but kindness and being nice and sharing. So where's that, in fact, um, sensibility fit with the more formal arrangements that you can see um, in Europe? So they've got memorandums of understanding with um, Clarence and Zari or, or mm -hmm. um, um, So they work in complementarity? Um, so I'm, not, I'm going to give you a, a dodgy answer for that question, I'm afraid. Um, I think you get more done if you don't do that. Sorry. That's not a dodgy answer, that's quite a direct answer, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I suppose what for me was, it was palpable that people who felt the same, the same problems, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And so it's that having that mentality and that psychology to say, well, I've already solved it, here you go. And I think that's incredibly powerful. And, you know, I'm trying my best to keep that energy going. Um, but, you know, there, there's, a, there's a group of us. So, um, and I'm, I really am, you know, I'm hoping I've sown the seed here. Somebody's been inspired because please join us. Okay, we might uh, draw a to close there. I think I mentioned the cheese sandwiches. <laughs> Uh, could you join me in thanking both our speakers again for the talk?
And uh, that will be here around lunchtime, so please carry on those conversations over lunch yesterday. Thank you very much.